back when I was a teenager and not just a little bit of an edge lord, I really became interested in science. This manifested in a certainty in God's non existence, and I couldn't understand how anyone could get particularly far in any scientific field while hanging on to the anchor of religion. Logically, I knew religious scientists existed. The idea was just anathema to me. But I moved along the academic path, and gradually my attitude mellowed. I ended up appreciating how, even if it wasn't for myself, someone might see the hand of some ineffable being in a particularly elegant astrophysical equation or quantum phenomena or the like. I wonder then how my younger self would react to being told that one of the world's top rocket scientists and founding member of JPL was also a practicing occultist who performed rituals to summon the Antichrist. On the 2nd of October 1914, Ruth Virginia Whiteside gave birth to Marvel Whiteside Parsons. Her husband, Marvel H. Parsons, to pass this story rather immediately, he was exposed as having cheated on Ruth, who, shocking for the time, promptly kicked his ass out in 1915. From then on, Marvel became John, or Jack, to his friends. Ruth moved herself and John in with her parents, or rather, Walter and Carrie Whiteside packed up their things and moved to their daughter in California. John's grandfather became John's father figure until Walter's death in 1932. They were fairly well off, implied by John living for a time on South Orange Grove Avenue, Pasadena so-called Millionaire's Mile. While the family hopped around Pasadena, Parsons met his lifelong friend, Edward S. Foreman. They shared an interest in the exciting new genre of science fiction, as well as exploding holes in the back garden. Beginning with lighting fireworks in 1928, they soon upgraded to custom solid fuels, experimenting with various gunpowder mixes bound in glue. 28 also sees Parsons' first brief foray into the occult, at least according to him. Recalling in 1948, he states, I was shown myself as a boy of 13 in this life, invoking Satan and showing cowardice when he appeared. The reason why he decided to do this isn't clear, but he doesn't seem to pick up that particular torch again for some time. Newton 2. Accelerating mass means proportional force is happening. Newton 3. Force applied to a mass will be opposed by equal reactive force. This implies that by accelerating a mass, you get a reactive force in the opposite direction. A good way to accelerate mass is to explode it. Because chemistry, these explosions tend to need oxygen to really get going. So if you mix up your explosion mass, which we'll call fuel, with an oxygen source, which we'll call an oxidizer, your mixed mass, which we'll call propellant, will keep on exploding until it runs out of chemicals to react. Now these explosions will throw out a lot of mass, which we'll term producing thrust. So what you want to do is funnel that thrust in a single direction. Because physics, the mass container will react with an opposing force, moving in an opposite direction to the thrust. Et voila, a rocket. Parsons and Foreman quickly pushed their rocketry well beyond the Amsha. 1932 saw them heating black powder and casting it in a wax matrix with aluminium. They'd been in communication with the international rocket community and were sharing research though they stopped once they realised they were giving more information than they were receiving. Meanwhile, they graduated from a private university school and spent two years at the University of Southern California, though neither graduated. Parsons was also getting professional experience, picking up part-time work with the Hercules Powder Company, before leaving in 1934 for Halifax Explosives. In 1935, Parsons married Helen Northrup. More importantly, he and Foreman attended grad student William Bollet's lecture at Caltech, the subject, the experimental rocketry of Eugene Singer, finishing with speculation about stratospheric passenger carriers. After the lecture, Parsons and Foreman approached the student, asking him about life at Caltech and how one might go about gaining funding for their experiments. Bollet directed them towards another student, Frank Molina. Frank evidently recognised the curious symbiosis of the two as useful. Parsons being an imaginative and accomplished theoretician, Foreman having the rigorous practical engineering chops to back it up. 
Parsons was a self-trained chemist who, although he lacked the discipline of formal higher education, had an uninhibited and fruitful imagination. He loved poetry and the exotic aspects of life. Foreman, a skilled mechanic, had been working for some time with Parsons on powder rockets. They wanted to build a liquid propellant rocket motor, but found they lacked adequate technical and financial resources for the task. They hoped to find help at Caltech. They were sent to me, and that was the beginning of the story which led to the establishment of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. At the time, Lena was working for the Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory. He and his two new comrades were rejected for funding by then Galkit president Clark Milliken, but found a sympathetic source of support in Melina's professor, Theodore von Kármán. As Galkit director, he allowed the three informal use of the Galkit labs for their research. Their first goal, a working motor. They recognised that other experimenters often skipped stationary tests in favour of going straight into test flights, resulting in frequent failure. Von Kármán managed to persuade Galkit to lease three acres around the Arroyo Seco, where JPL sits today. By April of 1936, Molina had noted that Parsons and Foreman had taken jobs at a powder company, suggesting Parsons at least was back with Halifax to gain some funds. There was, after all, no money in their passion. Galkit largely dismissed the endeavour as fanciful sci-fi, meaning that for a long time the group was self-funded, scrimping, saving and borrowing tanks, hoses and other equipment where they could. April seemed to begin a period of radio silence, however, until over a month later, on May 24th, when Parsons called Molina to report that he had almost completed the rocket motor. Testing began on the 18th of June, Molina reporting on Parsons' use of ballistite as a fuel, a smokeless propellant patented by Alfred Noble. That summer also saw the group grow, as the trio were joined by Amo Smith, Carlos Wood and Rudolf Schott. Smith was another Caltech student, but the latter two seemed to have just wandered onto the testing grounds and offered to help. They were followed by Molina's new roommate, Martin Summerfield, in September. That year's Halloween saw a series of tests that, although Molina would regard as another set of failures, came to be regarded as JPL's birth. This photo is known as the Nativity Scene, and for many years the scene was recreated with mannequins for JPL's open house days. At this point they were using methyl alcohol as their test fuel. Progress was recorded as a measure of firing time, and progress they did. November 28th had their rocket fire for 20 seconds. By January 37, this was up to 44 seconds. Ready to measure thrust, the gang moved their experiments back to Galkit proper in April. With another new member, Xian Shui Sen, they mounted their rocket onto a 50-foot pendulum in order to measure thrust by the swing. This saw firing times of up to an entire minute. Their welcome back on campus was limited. Folks didn't seem to appreciate their reduced proximity to explosions. Explosions that often resulted in clouds of methyl alcohol and nitrogen dioxide settling on and rusting their expensive equipment. Their exploits quickly gained the group the nickname The Suicide Squad, a name which came unsettlingly close to accurate when their setup exploded, flinging metal into a wall where Molina had stood just minutes before. This incident would see the group move their research back to the Arroyo. At the end of term, Parsons invited Molina to stay with him while everyone had drifted away for the summer. They ended up writing a novel together, with characters loosely based on the Caltech group. For a great deal of his life, Molina was a fairly ardent proponent of communism, so it's unsurprising the story was rife with anti-capitalist, anti-war themes. The fictional rocket scientists struggled to maintain the scientific purity of their research, opposed by evil industrial types in their sycophants, who tried to manipulate the work to more selfish ends. Of particular note to our story is the character based on Parsons. Theophile Belvedere is described as a mystic who speaks for religion and the organised church, who after being investigated for anti-capitalist leanings, ultimately dies in an explosive experiment gone awry. Parsons began to be recognised for his expertise. He was called up as an expert on explosives during a murder trial. It seems a vice investigator had gone on the wrong side of some crooked cops, who promptly silenced him through careful application of car bomb. Parsons, ever the scientist, created a replica bomb and used it to blow up an abandoned car. He concluded that the bomb had to contain smokeless powder rather than some other explosive, and he was so absolutely certain in his testimony that he held up resolutely against cross-examination. Remember, he is only 23 years old at this point, which suggests an impressive level of fortitude. Sometime in 1939, Parsons was visiting one Robert Rapinski. The MIT graduate owned a car dealership, and the two had been good friends ever since Rob sold Parsons a second-hand car back in 1934. This particular visit would prove to be the more consequential, however, when Parsons picked up a book from his friend's library. Conks on Pax, written by Alistair Crowley in 1907, 
seems a series of allegories and satires along the theme of magical initiation. The title itself was a phrase supposedly said to those higher initiates of Demeter's Eleusinian mysteries, giving them leave to depart. The book had a profound effect on Parsons. Rapinski, less inspired, gifted the book to his friend. After that, Parsons was all in. He started correspondence with the book's arcane author, and attended meetings at the home of local OTO rep Wilfred Talbot Smith. Wilfred Smith was a British immigrant, spending some years in Canada, where he joined the Ordo Templi Orientis's British Columbia Lodge No. 1. He quickly gained seniority, however, following, shall we say, unfortunate circumstances, the Canadian situation ended up somewhat imploding. He travelled south of the border, ending up in Los Angeles in 1922, with a view to reviving the North American OTO. He ran the Church of Thelema and regularly performed Gnostic Mass to a growing crowd. In 1935, he received permission from on high to set up his own lodge, Agape Lodge No. 1, holding meetings in his Hollywood home. It was at one of these meetings that John Parsons presented Helen and himself. John found something of a father figure in Smith, something he'd been seeking since the death of his grandfather. The couple began attending regularly, and in February 1941, the Parsons joined the Agape Lodge, becoming official members of the OTO. John took the name Frata Topan, standing for Thalemum Obtentum Procedero Amoris Nuptia, but also a declaration to Parsons' preferred deity. Gematria and their hidden meanings being big in Thalema, he played around with the spelling in order to use the supposedly more favourable Frata 210. There are notes of a military big shot visiting the Galkit group, who, rather laughably these days, didn't see military use of rocketry likely. Things changed when a more open-minded chap, General H. H. Arnold, convinced the National Academy of Sciences Committee of Air Corps Research to fund a grant for rocket research. In particular, they were asked initially to explore the feasibility of what came to be called jet-assisted takeoff, or JATOs, for use where runway length was at a premium. They were careful to use the term jet propulsion in their proposal, with the word rocket even now garnering scepticism. Not too long ago, MIT had rejected a similar project, the aeronautics head saying Carmen could take the Buck Rogers job. This proposal garnered them a $1,000 grant, followed by another 10000 from the American Rocket Society. The project was officially underway in 1940. The US still hadn't entered the war raging in the East, but trade practices led to her being referred to as the arsenal of democracy, and military spending increased accordingly. The Galkit team's successes led the National Academy of Sciences to grant them a further $22,000 to begin Galkit Project No. 1 with von Karman as director. Molina's mate Summerfield had his own liquid fuel research going on on the side, but the project's main focus was solid fuel. Their first major success was with Galkit 27. The formula had moved away from the centuries-old potassium nitrate-based black powder, replacing it with an ammonium nitrate-based mixture, a step Molina admits only Parsons could have thought of. This was bound by glue and blotting paper, much as Parsons and Foreman had been doing since they were kids. Parsons had the further idea to press the mixture in inch-thick layers, thereby controlling the burn. This was the fuel that would eventually be used in the group's first test on an actual plane in August of 1941. The pilot was another one of von Karman's students, a Captain Homer A. Boucher Jr. with the Army Air Corps. The test plane was a light air coupe with two arrays of six JATOs strapped to the wings. Each JATO provided 28 pounds of thrust for 12 seconds. Takeoff distance was reduced 30% and almost halved takeoff time, 13.1 seconds to 7.5. This step forward prompted the NAS to bump their grant up to 125,000. It wasn't a perfect solution. Parsons recognised that the JATOs had to be used almost immediately. If left for a long time or put into extreme temperatures, they had the habit of exploding improperly. Further iterations of the fuel formula attempted to rectify this. Galkit 46, for example, replaced the ammonium nitrate with guanidinium nitrate, which saw limited success. The proverbial Great Leap Forward appeared around June 42. Parsons was using a new mix based on potassium perchlorate. His big idea, however, was to replace the glue binding with molten asphalt. The reports vary as to where Parsons' inspiration came from, from watching roofers to a familiarity with Greek fire. However it came about, it worked. The fuel no longer cracked or shrunk, and could be stored indefinitely. Even better, this allowed the fuel to be poured directly into the casing, removing an intermediate moulding process. But wait, there's more! This also allowed Parsons to invent a method of pouring, starting with a little of the hot liquid mixture as a primer, allowing it to cool, then pouring the rest. 
This technique proved to have significant longevity, as it was still being used for refueling the SRBs for the space shuttle. The result of these innovations was Galkit 53, the first castable composite solid propellant, and marked the birth of modern solid propellant rocketry. The breakthroughs convinced von Karman and co to create a company to make and sell their not rockets, no guys really, and under which future patents could be assigned. Von Karman, his attorney Hallery, Molina, Summerfield, Parsons and Foreman put in $200 each to create Aerojet Corporation. Immediately, Parsons and Foreman left Galkit in order to work at their new company, though the groups would remain intertwined. They moved on to researching liquid propellants. Starting with petrol as their fuel, Parsons seemed dead set on making red fuming nitric acid work as their oxidizer, despite it being the cause of a fairly devastating explosion back when they were starting out. Their current test burned, though, unevenly, causing the thrust to chug. An acquaintance of Molina had the idea of using aniline to control the burn. Molina realised that the combo would be self-igniting, they wouldn't need to use benzene, petrol or some other combustible. After some tests to confirm, the team was on their way to liquid motors. The flight test was performed by Major Paul H. Dane in a Douglas A20A, far heavier than their initial air coupe. Two liquid jators were attached, each with 1,000 pounds of thrust and 25 second burn time. Takeoff distance was reduced by another 30%, earning another substantial budget increase. This work was largely done by Molina and Summerfield, but Parsons' name was included on the three resultant patents for the process, acknowledging that it was his insistence that they use red fuming nitric acid that made it possible. This acid aniline mix would be used up to the late 50s Titan ICBMs, when it could be replaced by liquid oxygen. Aerojet quickly acquired contracts, the US being all in with WW2 by now. The US Navy was first, with an order of both solid and liquid fuel units, with the AAC not far behind with $256,000 put towards 2,000 of Parsons' solid design by 1943. Parsons' praise extended to his personal life. As soon as he had joined the Agape Lodge, he was a recognised talent. Smith wrote to Crowley not long after Parsons' admission, saying that I think I have at long last a really excellent man, John Parsons. And starting next Tuesday, he begins a course of talks with a view to enlarging our scope. Parsons met Soror Estai, aka silent film actor Jane Wolfe, a longtime filmite who had been initiated by a Sicily dwelling Crowley in 1920, prior to Mussolini kicking him out. She saw similar potential in Parsons, writing in her journal, I see him as the real successor of Therion, also noting that she believed him to be potentially bisexual, at the very least. With rockets finally making him money, John and Helen ended up renting 1003 South Orange Grove Avenue, a rather lovely but sadly no longer extant house, originally owned by local philanthropist Arthur Fleming. Wilfred Smith lived in a separate coach house on the property, and they ended up moving Agape Lodge there. The house gained the nickname The Parsonage, complete with the cult library and the Parsons' own bedroom doubling as the temple. They were certainly an unusual addition to the upmarket neighbourhood, the couple holding parties and renting out rooms to myriad undesirables. Indeed, an ad for tenants specified, only bohemians, artists, musicians, anarchists, or other exotic types need apply for rooms. One neighbour observed that two women in diaphanous gowns would dance around a pot of fire, surrounded by coffins topped with candles, which sounds like a good time. And at some point, the police investigated reports of a pregnant woman jumping nude through fire. Parsons' FBI file makes frequent mention of his membership in a religious cult at this time, which went under the name Church of Thelema. Descriptive literature indicated this cult broadly hinted at free love. Redacted had received several complaints of strange goings-on at this home, and that he recalled at the time that it was a gathering place of perverts. When interviewed on the matter by special agents, Parsons insisted that they merely studied philosophy as well as religion, and attempted to inform themselves concerning all types and kinds of religion. He further stated that the Church of Thelema was dedicated to the freedom and liberty of the individual. Parsons advised at this time that they were anti-communistic and anti-fascist. You can really taste that repressive je ne sais quoi that bubbled into McCarthyism, but it would be disingenuous of me to say that the Parsonage didn't promote a certain laissez-faire attitude to fidelity. Wilfred Smith, while leader of the Lodge, garnered a reputation as being a bit of a womaniser, taking a series of scarlet women for his magical workings up to and including Helen Parsons. In a display of irony, Crowley himself accused Smith of giving the OTO 
the reputation of being that slimy abomination, a love cult. The final straw seemed to be when Helen ended up pregnant by Smith. It's like as not Crowley wasn't so much appalled by Smith, as much as he was looking for an excuse to oust him. Letters between Carl Germer and the California Lodge show that Smith was quickly falling out of favour, with Germer no doubt persuading Crowley that he was impeding the spiritual growth of his charges. Too much Wilfred Smith, as it were, not enough Frater 132. Crowley's plan to remove him was as clever as it was convoluted. He started by drawing up Smith's horoscope, and wouldn't you believe it, he found it to be so full of meaning that the truth could only be that Smith was something special. I'll let the man himself explain his reasoning, as published in Liber Apotheosis. 666, making considerations of the true will or destiny of Fra 132, was haunted persistently by the word apotheosis. The Kabbalistic value of this word is 645, which added to 132 gives 777, the horoscope. This is one of the most astonishingly fortunate figures that Fra 666 has ever set up in his whole life. There are no less than eight planets in close aspect. A complex of more than five planets is rare. Of eight, Fra 666 knows one only, William Shakespeare, beside Wilfred Smith. Crowley seems to take a cathartic moment to absolutely drag the man. Yet no corresponding qualities could be found in the man. He has no birth, no breeding, no education. Physically, he is a meagre specimen. Mentally and morally, he possesses every vice, every defect conceivable. Spiritually, he has no attainments to his credit. His achievements are null. To set off these flaws, he can boast few virtues. Even his persistence in upholding the order may have been due to self-preservation rather than to loyalty. Accordingly, the horoscope is completely absurd and nonsensical. Indeed, a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. Before landing the final blow, yet with all that has been said against Fra 132, there is no doubt that something in him demands and receives the most extravagant, blind, unreasonable devotion. The simple, the astounding truth flooded the mind of Fra 666 with light. It explains all obscurities, it reconciles all contradictions. We have all of us throughout been blinded by a single misapprehension, precisely as if a staff of astronomers, mistaking a planet for a star, observed its motion and so found nothing but irritating, bewildering, inexplicable attacks upon the laws of nature. All became clear on recognising the fundamental mistake. Wilfred T. Smith, Fra 132, is not a man at all. He is the incarnation of some god. Shit. The only way he reasoned for Smith to let loose this god and achieve his full magical potential was to identify the god that dwelt within, which could only be achieved by immediately packing up and heading into magical seclusion, following a number of requirements and restrictions. The divine nature must never be contaminated or cheapened by human associations. It should be most convenient for him to dwell in a tent or shack, preferably on some remote yet consecrated place. His words must be utterances followed by silence. And of course, to emphasize the solemnity of his dedication and his irrevocable nature, it would be wise for him to cause the mark of the beast to be tattooed upon his forehead or in the palm of his right hand. Also, if he choose, over his heart and upon his mons veneris. His main work will, of course, be to use such practices, invocations, etc., as will help him to establish his identity. Oh, and Helen should go with him. The reality of feeling is hinted at in correspondence between Wolf and Germa, the latter worrying about Wolf and Parson's continued fondness for the exiled magus. The question is not that of a three-week retirement for Smith, but of putting him temporarily outside the order until such time that he has proved his worth for reinstatement. You still take the side of Smith and try to excuse him, I had said all you people are overawed. 666 says it better. Smith vampirizes you, and as is usual, the vampirized never sees it. That is why everything is so hopeless. In the end, Crowley and Germa had their way. Smith was sent away, and while he did make attempts to return to the parsonage, he was rebuffed. Leadership of the lodge was instead handed to young Parsons, who thought Crowley had been rather unfair to Smith. He sent a letter of resignation but Crowley dismissed it. He still believed Parsons to be a considerable magical talent, though grew concerned about his remaining attachment to Smith. To Wolfe, he wrote, Jack's trouble is his weakness, and his romantic side, the poet, is at present a hindrance. He gets a kick from some magazine trash or an occult novel, and dashes off in wild pursuit. 
I wish to God I had him for six months, even three with a hustle, to train in will, in discipline. Though I imagine at this time Parsons was rather fond of his romantic side. However stung he might have been about his wife having a child with his mentor, he found solace in the arms of her sister Betty. Betty took the role of High Priestess in Gnostic Mass, which in a display of Parsons' devotion began to be held every day. The two performed prolonged sex magic rituals and generally seemed to have a passion for one another. In later years, Alva C. Rogers, writer and parsonage tenant, wrote of their relationship. Betty, who had been living with Jack for a number of years, complimented him admirably. She was young, blonde, very attractive, full of joie de vivre, thoughtful, humorous, generous and all that. She assisted Jack in the OTO and seemed to possess the same devotion to it and Crowley as did Jack. The rapport between Jack and Bessie, the strong affection, if not love, they had for each other, despite their frequent extracurricular activities, seemed pretty permanent and shatterproof. These extracurricular activities were of a similar variety to those between John and Helen, for Parsons considered himself above the petty jealousies of other men, and encouraged Betty to take other lovers herself. Parsons, for his part, seems to have been a little better than Smith in this regard, a charming and not unattractive chap. He had a number of affairs with the women in the Aerojet secretary pool. Oh look, it's a segue. Yes, Aerojet was still around, pumping out rockets, sorry, JATOs, to the US military, and Parsons was making reasonable bank. By the summer of 1943, Aerojet had done $650,000 in business, and he and Von Karman were invited aboard the USS Charger to give a demonstration for the Secretary of the Navy. The demonstration was technically successful. Von Karman and Parsons fitted some solid fuel JATOs to a Grumman aircraft, and the JATOs performed as expected. Unfortunately, they also released a cloud of yellow smoke that covered the observers with residue. There were angry faces, but the Secretary promised them a contract so long as they got rid of the smoke. This led to the development of Aeroplex, smokeless powder from Aerojet. Back at his old stomping grounds, Galkit Project No. 1 was officially becoming Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Melina and Summerfield managed, for a time, to get the goal of their project back to the stratospheric, sending meteorological equipment into the high atmosphere. Though their rockets, called private, were basically Parsons JATOs with fins and a nose cone attached. In 45, Melina was called back onto military work with Project Ordkit, though his sergeant and corporal never saw use in World War II, possibly a relief to the anti-war commie. It is an irony that Aerojet, its founders starting from a distinctly anti-war mindset, had become almost entirely dependent on military contracts. With the war coming to a close, they needed to re-strategize. They courted investment from General Tyre, who were happy to buy in. The catch was that they wanted to clean house. They offered the old founders 50 grand a pop for their stock, and all sold out, except for Molina, who, in London at the time, didn't get the message. He later claimed sunspot activity had disrupted the telegram with the offer. As it turns out, the sun was on his side, as holding on made the communist a future millionaire. As it happens, Parsons was ahead of his time once more, though, given a Molina situation, that might have been to his detriment. He and Foreman had actually cashed out the year before, Parsons using his money to buy the parsonage outright. The old friend started a new but short-lived explosives company, Adastra Research, which was promptly investigated for espionage when the two were found with large quantities of ex-nitrite. Charges were dropped when it was determined that the substance had been kept for purely experimental reasons, but it appears Parsons then went to work for Vulcan Powder Company instead. Along with his OTO work, Parsons held the occasional sci-fi gathering in his home. One fateful August, 1945, sci-fi illustrator Lou Goldstone brought a friend of his, middling pulp fiction author and inveterate conman, Lafayette Ronald Hubbard. Parsons was immediately charmed, and the two became good friends. And Parsons wasn't the only one taken in by Hubbard's charms. Rogers writing, I liked Ron from the first. He had a tremendously engaging personality. For several weeks, he dominated the scene with his wit and inexhaustible fund of anecdotes. Unfortunately, Ron's reputation for spinning tall tales made for a certain degree of scepticism in the minds of his audience. At any rate, he told one hell of a good story. The house being open to people of his ilk, Hubbard moved in. Reporter Nielsen Himmel shared a room with the man and noted, Hubbard came in. He was irresistible to women, swept girls off their feet. There were other girls living there with guys, and he went through them one by one. Finally, he fastened on to Betty. Parsons was desperately in love, but could not countenance marriage because of his beliefs. The atmosphere became very tense. Yes, it seems Parsons' desire to be beyond jealousy had backfired once more. As Rogers put it, 
Jack began to show more and more strain, and the effort to disguise his metamorphosis from emotionless Crowleyite Superman to a jealousy-ridden human became hopeless. Things came to a head that December, as I'll quote in full. The final desperate act on Jack's part, to reverse events and salvage something of the past, from the ruin that stared him in the face, occurred in the still early hours of a bleak morning in December. Our room was just across the hall from Jack's apartment, the largest in the house, which also doubled as a temple, or whatever, of the OTO. We were brought out of a sound sleep by some weird and disturbing noises, seemingly coming from Jack's room, which sounded for all the world as though someone were dying, or at the very least, were deathly ill. We went out into the hall to investigate the source of the noises, and found that they came from Jack's partially opened door. Perhaps we should have turned around and gone back to bed at this point, but we didn't. The noise, which by this time we could tell was a sort of chant, drew us inexorably to the door, which we pushed open a little further in order to better see what was going on. What we saw I'll never forget, although I find it hard to describe in any detail. The room, in which I had been before, was decorated in a manner typical to any occultist's lair, with all the symbols and appurtenances essential to the proper practice of black magic. It was dimly lit and smoky from incense. Jack was draped in a black robe and stood with his back to us, his hands outstretched, in the centre of a pentagram before some sort of altar affair on which several indistinguishable items stood. His voice, which was actually not very loud, rose and fell in the rhythmic chant of gibberish, which was delivered with such passionate intensity that its meaning was frighteningly obvious. After this brief and uninvited glimpse into the blackest and most secret centre of a tortured man's soul, we quietly withdrew and returned to our room where we spent the balance of the night discussing in whispers what we had just witnessed. Evidently, whatever ritual was being performed, it had some measure of success. Parsons wrote in his own diary, I have been suffered to pass through an ordeal of human love and jealousy. I have found a staunch companion and comrade in Ron. Ron and I are to continue with our plans for the Order. He reported to Crowley the next month, most beloved father, about three months ago, I met Captain L. Ron Hubbard. He moved in with me about two months ago, and although Betty and I are still friendly, she has transferred her sexual affections to him. I think I have made a great gain, and as Betty and I are the best of friends in this, there is little loss. I cared for her deeply, but I have no desire to control her emotions, and I can, I hope, control my own. I need a magical partner. I have many experiments in mind. The next time I tie up with a woman... It will be on my own terms. Thy son, John. Parsons had those most enviable of things, time and money, so he set about throwing himself into his magic. He was partial to invoking elementals, that is, beings associated with the Empedoclean elements of earth, fire, air and water. A previous misadventure had Wolf writing to Germa. Our own Jack is enamoured with witchcraft, the Hunfor, voodoo. From the start, he always wanted to evoke something, no matter what, I'm inclined to think, as long as he got a result. According to Mika yesterday, he has had a result, an elemental he doesn't know what to do with. From that statement of hers, it must bother him, somewhat at least. Parsons' flippancy with regards to such activities worried people. Mika there also reporting that some of the more sensitive residents had to constantly perform banishings, that they knew there was something alien and inimical in the house. Parsons himself noted that one of his rituals was liable to produce dangerous side phenomena and sometimes permanent haunting. He was going off book and had even started development of his own system in the gaps he felt Crowley had left in books called The Witchcraft and The Gnosis. Worse, he was about to break his oath, allowing the outsider Hubbard knowledge of the upper grade secrets of the OTO. With Hubbard assisting, he began work on an extended ritual that came to be called The Babylon Working. Parsons explains the method in his book, The Book of Babylon. The initial attention was to obtain the assistance of an elemental mate. A well-known procedure, he claims, citing Crowley's magic in theory and practice. In summary, this involved one of John Dee's Enochian air tablets, an air dagger, a whole string of air-based rituals involving lengthy prose and tracing specific pentagrams and hexagrams in the air, thereby summoning air-based angels with names like someone appended a game of Scrabble. This punctuated by an 8th degree practice, Invocation of the Wand with Material Basis on Talisman. That is, he brought his, uh, rockets to explode. 
Then he had to redo all the pentagrams and hexagrams previously traced backwards to safely banish the entity summoned and untie the mystical knot he had constructed around himself. This entire thing, from memory, twice a day for 12 days. Meanwhile, he reported a heavy windstorm had developed. His lamp was thrown to the ground, and a fellow resident had a candle knocked out of his hand by some unseen force. All this time, Hubbard was acting as scribe, D to Parsons Kelly. On the last day, Parsons writes, Jan 15, invoked twice. At this time, the scribe developed some sort of astral vision, describing in detail an old enemy of mine, of whom he had never heard, and later, the guardian forms of Isis and the Archangel Michael. Following the ritual, everyone in the house reported feeling tension, and on the 18th, Hubbard and Parsons decided to head into the Mojave to relax. At sunset, however, Parsons felt the tension suddenly leave and declared, It is done. He later exclaimed his success to Crowley. I have my elemental. She turned up one night after the conclusion of the operation and has been with me since. She is an artist, strong-minded and determined, with strong masculine characteristics and a fanatical independence. Parsons' elemental was Marjorie Elizabeth Cameron. She joined Parsons at the lodge, taking the magical name Candida. In the Book of Babylon, Parsons describes her as an heir of fire type, with bronze red hair, fiery and subtle, determined and obstinate, sincere and perverse, with extraordinary personality, talent and intelligence. His elemental summoning success, an intermediate part of the working is described thus. During the period of January 19 to February 27, I invoked the goddess Babylon with the aid of my magical partner, as was proper to one of my grade. This was ninth degree work. It's unclear whether Parsons ever officially held that grade, though clearly he believed he did. Suffice it to say that here it means he worked with his new magical partner in a similar manner as he worked with himself in the previous part of the ritual. Cameron later confirmed that the rite involved the two of them spending two weeks in bed where Parsons educated her and made her aware that she had a mission in the world, though the specifics of the working were not revealed to her just yet. Afterwards, she popped back to New York while Parsons went back out to the Mojave to invoke Babylon. The presence of the goddess came upon me and I was commanded to write the following communication. The communication was Liber 49, a prophetic missive in a similar style to that dictated to Crowley by Iwas. It begins by claiming to be the fourth chapter of Liber Al, a marked departure from Thelemic orthodoxy. Yea, it is I, Babylon, and this is my book, that is the fourth chapter of the Book of the Law, he completing the name, for I am out of Nuit by Horus, the incestuous sister of Rahur Kuit. It also reveals Parson's grand purpose. He was going to produce nothing less than the Antichrist. Okay, not really. Well, kinda. Magical children are common enough in mythology, and Thelema's inspired mishmash of esotericisms is no different. The Book of the Law states, But let her raise herself in pride. Let her follow me in my way. Let her work be the work of wickedness. Let her kill her heart. Let her be loud and adulterous. Let her be covered in jewels and rich garments. And let her be shameless before all men. Then I will lift her to pinnacles of power. Then I will breed from her a child mightier than all the kings of the earth. This magical child is often conflated with the moon child, which, in Crowleyanity circles, is a reference to Crowley's novel of the same name. The plot involves a so-called white mage, seducing and persuading a woman to be impregnated with the soul of an otherworldly being, the eponymous moon child, allegedly to raise up and save the soul of humanity. A number of people have been considered to be this child, in fact Jane Wolfe believed it was Parsons himself. Parsons apparently disagreed, convinced that instead the Thelemic Messiah was female, and now he had divine backing, he was determined to bring her about himself. Now know that I, Babylon, would take flesh and come among men. I shall provide a vessel, when or whence, I say not. Seek her not, call her not. Let her declare. Ask nothing, keep silence. There shall be ordeals. I hasten to add that it's unlikely he was looking for a literal child. When Cameron returned from New York, she revealed she was in fact pregnant, and Parsons agreed to her getting an abortion. No, this was more of a spiritual thing. He was expecting a fully grown woman to turn up, much as Cameron did, and give the appropriate signs that she was Babylon on Earth. The second part of the ritual got underway on the 2nd of March, having been dictated by Hubbard the night before. He'd been out of town, but knowing nothing of Parsons' desert invocations, 
returned claiming visions of a savage and beautiful woman riding naked on a great cat-like beast. He felt there was a message waiting to be channeled. Parsons and Hubbard set up the temple, robed in black and white respectively, put on some tunes, and did the D. Kelly thing once more. Parsons and Cameron proceeded to enact the given instructions. On the night of the first performance of these rituals, I prepared the altar and box and food, also flowers and wine. At the beginning of the rituals, I burned the Enochian tablet and smashed an image of Pan, a favoured possession. Then followed a series of invocations, mostly extracts from other Crowley work, including part of the Gnostic Mass, and an excerpt from Crowley's play, Tannhauser. The result, aside from a part in Enochian, is a racy exchange of loving declarations, quite romantic really. The next day saw another scribe session, revealing the final two rituals. The second ritual involved staring into a black box until a sign or symbol appear, then to construct the sign in wood. Then to paint upon it a second symbol that Parsons would already know, or else divine from a crystal ball. Alongside the more tangible actions like lighting a flame, some kind of tantric meditation and the spilling of the blood of birth onto a white sheet, the third ritual called for Parsons to compose, with the aid of a muse, a suitable invocation to Babylon's birth. This poem is what ends the Book of Babylon. It's a nice show of Parsons' creative talent and ends with what I think is a nice thesis statement of this whole ordeal. Ye shall laugh and love and follow her dance when the wrath of God is gone, and dream no more of hell and hate in the birth of Babylon. Soon after, Parsons wrote to Crowley to exclaim his confidence. I have had the most important and devastating experience of my life between February 2nd and March 4th. I believe it was the result of the ninth degree working with the girl who answered my elemental summons. He explains the situation in vagaries. I cannot tell you the depth of reality, the poignancy, terror and beauty I have known. Now I am back in the world, weak with reaction. But the knowledge remains. I have found my will. It is to serve, and serve I shall. All I am, or will be, is pledged. Back in the world, Parsons' focus on his own work had been felt. His leadership of Agape Lodge had seen it somewhat devolve into a den of petty bickering, and Crowley sent Grady McMurtry to investigate. McMurtry characterised the place as Hodgepodge Lodge, though sang a familiar tune to Crowley that Parsons was a man of integrity and aspiration. All he lacks is an experienced instructor. He is easily the outstanding personality of the whole group. Seeing hope, he and Parsons planned an advertising and initiation campaign, promising that Parsons was shaking the debris of Agape from his shoulders and preparing to make a clean start with a more ambitious programme than ever. A lesser man would have washed his hands of the affair. Crowley was becoming less convinced, and after hearing of the Babylon working, wrote to Parsons about his concerns. It seems to me that there is danger of your sensitiveness upsetting your balance. Any experience that comes your way, you have a tendency to overestimate. I will ask you to bear in mind that you have one fulcrum for all your levers, and that is your original oath to devote yourself to raising mankind. You being as sensitive as you are, it behooves you to be more on your guard than would be the case with the majority of people. And to Germa he confided, Apparently he or Hubbard or somebody is producing a moon child. I get fairly frantic when I contemplate the idiocy of these goats. Maybe he was concerned for Parsons' spiritual well-being. Maybe he was just annoyed that he hadn't gotten around to it himself. Either way, all either of them could do was wait. And while they waited, Hubbard came to Parsons with a real keen idea. See, he, Betty and Parsons had gone into business together, creating a company, Allied Enterprises. Together they pooled roughly $22,000, and by together, I mean just under 21000 of that came from Parsons alone. The idea was to buy boats relatively cheaply on the East Coast, sell them round to the West Coast, and sell for a profit. In April, Ron and Betty left with ten grand to do just that. A month later, Kel surprise, Betty and Ron are hanging out on a boat in Miami. This is recorded by OTO initiate Lewis Culling in a letter to Germa. As you may know by this time, Brother Jack signed a partnership agreement with this Ron and Betty, whereby all money earned by the three for life is equally divided between the three. As far as I can ascertain, Brother Jack has put in all of his money. Meanwhile, Ron and Betty have bought a boat for themselves in Miami for about $10,000 and are living the life of Riley, while Brother Jack is living at rock bottom, and I mean rock bottom. Crowley himself telegrammed Germa on the matter, correctly assessing that, suspect Ron playing confidence trick, John Parsons, weak fool, obvious victim, prowling swindlers. In June, even Parsons the weak fool had had quite enough. 
He travelled to Miami and discovered his business partners had purchased three boats, though he only found two, the Harpoon and Blue Water 2. Two days later, he received word that Harpoon had been taken out. Parsons acted accordingly, as documented to Crowley. Here I am in Miami, pursuing the children of my folly. Hubbard attempted to escape me by sailing at 5pm, and I performed a full invocation to Bartzabal, within the circle, at 8pm. At the same time, so far as I can check, his ship was struck by a sudden squall off the coast, which ripped off his sails and forced him back to port. They cannot move without going to jail. By the time that letter was sent, he had sued Allied Enterprises. Parsons received two of the three boats in the settlement, Blue Water 2 and Diane, with Hubbard holding Harpoon as collateral against a $2,900 promissory note. Hubbard was also ordered to pay Parsons legal fees. There is where Hubbard leaves our story to pursue his own abhorrent machinations that you can find explored elsewhere. Parsons, alas, returned to Pasadena somewhat broken, not to mention near broke. He found himself unable to continue his regular donations to Crowley, nor to his ex-wife and mentor, who had married sometime between now and Smith's retirement. He seems to have become rather jaded by the whole scene. He sent Crowley a letter of resignation, with little in explanation. He professed his continued belief in the rights of man set forth in Libre Oz, but confessed that I do not believe that the OTO, as an autocratic organisation, constitutes a true and proper medium for the expression and attainment of these principles. Life became comparatively more mundane for Parsons. He left his job at Vulcan to accept an offer with the North American Aviation Corporation. He and Cameron got married that October and moved house. The next couple of years were a staccato of consulting work for the LAPD, LA District's Attorney Office, National Defence Research Council and the Office of Scientific Research and Development, among others. On the 21st of March, 1947, President Harry S. Truman signed United States Executive Order 9835, bringing about the policies that would become known as McCarthyism. The provision we're interested in guards against membership in, affiliation with, or sympathetic association with any organisations labelled as totalitarian, fascist, communist, or subversive. And wouldn't you know it, that covered a group that had been subject to many accusations of perversion and evil spooky shit. In the May of 1948, Parsons lost his government security clearance. This was partially due to his membership in a religious cult believed to advocate sexual perversion, which had been reported subversive. But a read of his FBI file suggests that it was also in part due to an association with communists and belonging to such subversive organisations as the American Civil Liberties Union. This would be a problem shared by comrades Molina, Summerfield, and of course Chinese national Xian Sui Sen, who was subject to five years of house arrest before allegedly being swapped for some Korean War POWs. Times of stress pull us back to familiar comforts, and on 1948's All Hallows' Eve, Babylon called Parsons back to his work. Now it came to pass, even as Babylon told me, for after receiving her book, I fell away from magic, and put away her book and all pertaining thereto, and I was stripped of my fortune, and my house, and all I possessed. Then, for a period of two years, I worked in the world, recouping my fortune somewhat. But that was also taken from me, and my reputation, and my good name in my worldly work that was in science. And on the 31st of October, 1948, Babylon called on me again, and I began the last work that was the work of the wand. He spent 17 days on some working, the culmination of which was Babylon appearing to him in a dream, instructing him. He was to embark on an astral working, a black pilgrimage, that took him into the sunset with her sign, and into the night, past accursed and desolate places and cyclopean ruins, and so came at last to the city of Corazin, and there a great tower of black basalt was raised, that was part of a castle whose further battlements reeled over the gulf of stars. Here he was shown a series of failed mages past, from Simon Magus to the one I mentioned earlier, himself at thirteen, summoning Satan but cowering in fear when he appeared. And I was asked, will you fail again? And I replied, I will not fail, for I had given all my blood to Babylon, and it was not I that spoke. And thereafter I was taken within and saluted the prince of that place, and thereafter things were done to me of which I may not write. And they told me, It is not certain that you will survive, but if you survive, you will attain your true will and manifest 
the Antichrist. Parsons then resolved to cross the abyss. Thelema has this concept called the abyss, a great void that separates our material world from the supernal real world, or in Kabbalistic parlance, the secret 11th Sephira Da'at, which isn't really a Sephira, but a combination of all 10 Sephirot existing together at their most ideal. Crossing the abyss to this ideal world, then, is regarded as one of the ultimate goals for the Thelemic magician, and success allows one to claim the title Magister Templi. Unfortunately, the way is blocked by a guardian, the demon Koronzon. Koronzon's role in all this is to destroy the ego of the prepared, that by shedding the concept of self, they may reach the supernal, or else he annihilates the unwary traveller. Crowley's own crossing is said to have occurred in 1909 in the Algerian desert, and was documented by Victor Neuberg in Lieber 418, The Vision and the Voice. His path described the crossing of 30 aethers, each requiring the evoking of the associated angels and guardians in order to pass. Crowley passed through 30 to 11, before being possessed by the 10th guardian, the aforementioned Koronzon, after which he was able to traverse the final nine. All said, Crowley's crossing took 30 days. It's assumed Parsons followed a similar path, which took him 40. At the end, he enlisted the aid of Smith to christen him Bilarion Armilus Aldajal, Antichrist a combination of Abrahamic Antichrist types. Finally, Parsons took his oath of a Magister Templi and set forth his Manifesto of the Antichrist. This manifesto held such dramatic goals as an end to the pretense and lying hypocrisy of Christianity, an end to the servile virtues and superstitious restrictions, an end to the slave morality, an end to prudery and shame, to guilt and sin, for these are of the only evil under the sun, that is fear. And importantly, I shall bring all men to the law of the beast 666, and in his law I shall conquer the world. And within seven years of this time, Babylon, the scarlet woman Hilarion, will manifest among ye, and bring this my work to its fruition. All he had to do was survive the next seven years. We find Parsons' circumstances take a turn for the better for a while. He saw his security clearance return, following his testimony reiterating that the Church of Thelema was just intellectualist japes and super anti-communist. Cameron, who had left him briefly after the investigation, returned and made a green box for Parsons with the Hebrew letter Shin, which Parsons used to keep his Babylon working documents in. He found new work with Hughes Aircraft, and by March 1950, Parsons held the impressive, if wordy, title of Group Leader in Charge of Propellant, Propulsion and Launching Group of the Research and Development Laboratories. While surely not the dizzying heights of his wartime success, things were looking good. During September 1950, Parsons was dismissed from Hughes Aircraft. He had been working on a proposal for a rocket propellant loading plant in Israel, and took home pages of information and drafts for said proposal. Unfortunately, these proposals contain classified information. He passed these documents to a friend for typing up, who apparently dobbed him in. He was promptly fired and information turned over to the FBI, who began an investigation for espionage. Now Parsons, for his part, denied any wrongdoing, claiming he was merely using excerpts from the documents for pricing his proposal, and that the typist friend and her husband held the necessary security clearance. The FBI, meanwhile, claimed that Parsons had intended to turn the files over to a friend who had offered him a job in Israel. What followed was a year and a half of interviews with friends and acquaintances of both John and Cameron, some with decidedly uncharitable things to say. Parsons' FBI file has someone calling him a crackpot, another characterising the couple as screwballs, and one witness stating that The Parsons are an odd and unusual pair, in that they do not live by the commonly accepted code of married life, and are both very fascinated by anything unusual or morbid, such as voodooism, cults, homosexuality, and religious practices that are different. The witness proceeds to frame Cameron as the dom of the pair, and that if John had intentionally committed an espionage, it was probably her bidding. In 51, the assistant US attorney opted against prosecution, but this didn't prevent Parsons' security clearance from being rescinded once more, and this time it wouldn't be reinstated. The stress once again led Parsons to familiar comfort, and he wrote a letter to the as yet unrevealed Babylon. My daughter, it is now four years since I entered the infernal chapel and partook of the sacrament of your incarnation. Since then, much that was prophesied has come to pass. I have been stripped of wealth, of honour, of love, 
and have participated not once, but twice in my own betrayal, as it was foretold. I do not know who you are, nor where you are at this writing, nor have I ever sought to know. This I do know, that you are incarnate, that you will manifest at the appointed time, to carry on the work that is from the beginning, that shall be until we have all entered the City of the Pyramids. The links are certain. The Beast 666, the Pole Star 132, the Dark Passionate Star Regina, the Bright Deceitful Star Cassop, the Disastrous Star of the White Scribe, and the Wandering Star, now nameless, in whom you were incarnated. It is through them that this work is possible. To them, you are Babylon, and through you, to all men, it is dedicated. Once more, the Parsons returned to South Orange Grove Avenue, this time to the coach house of 1071, where John spent his time replicating John Dee's Enochian tablets, as well as working on his own religious system in the Gnosis and the Witchcraft. He wrote a decidedly passive-aggressive letter to Karl Germer, now out ahead of the OTO since Crowley's death in 47, including the passage describing his situation. The operator has alternated satisfactorily between manic hysteria and depressing melancholy stupor on approximately 40 cycles, and satisfactory progress has been maintained in social ostracism, economic collapses and mental disassociation, before stating that he is off to Mexico to seek his holy guardian angel, before winding up in the guard, finally via the booby hotels, the graveyard or... If the final, you can tell all the little practices that I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Signed, no one, once called 210. Despite losing his security clearance, 52 seemed to be another reasonably good year. He had been making money at a petrol station, but now was back doing explosive work, part-time for the Burmite Powder Company, and helping with movie pyrotechnics with former JPL man Charles Bartley. It's possible this return to explosives contributed to what happened next. On the 17th of June, 8 past 5 in the afternoon, there was an explosion on South Orange Grove Avenue, followed quickly by a second. In the midst of this explosion was John Parsons. The blast destroyed his right arm, broke his left arm, both legs, and left a gaping hole in his jaw. Horrifically, he was still conscious when he was pulled out by a neighbour. He was rushed to Huntington Memorial Hospital, where he died at quarter to six. His mother Ruth was devastated. The two had held an immense bond since childhood, and she's reported to have said that she couldn't live without him before taking a lethal dose of pentobarbital. She died just three and a half hours after her son. Though no funeral was held, the OTO held a memorial service for Parsons. Helen and Betty attended, and Smith performed Gnostic Mass. His remains were cremated, and Cameron scattered his ashes to the Mojave. The manner of Parsons' death has inspired many theories that he was murdered, largely around the idea that such an accomplished chemist as he would never have been so foolish as to cause an explosion. It's true that there are some discrepancies that you're welcome to investigate, but I'm inclined to recall that, accomplished though he was, in all areas of life, Parsons displayed a certain negligence when it came to safety and protocol. From hoarding explosives at home, to taking home classified documents, to summoning elementals for kicks. More likely, an overworked man was mixing mercury fulminate with hands slick with sweat, accidentally dropped the can and reaching for it with his dominant hand. Missed. A tragic end to a remarkable man. But what of Babylon? Parsons didn't make the seven years required to see her incarnation, but one recalls the prophecy in the original Book of Babylon. Dedicate thy soul to her, for she shall absorb thee, and thou shalt become living flame before she incarnates. John Parsons was hugely influential, though little known today outside of two very different circles. Among the occult-minded, his praises are sung for his part in spreading Thelema in North America. But his leadership of Agape Lodge was arguably one of negligence. Meanwhile, he focused his efforts on a ritual that, while impressive in its scope, seems to have had questionable results. While he stayed true to the generalities of Crowley's work, later on, Crowley seemed more frustrated with the prodigy, and by the end, he had definitely departed from the path. In his own words, he felt that the OTO was an excellent training school for adepts, but hardly an appropriate order for the manifestation of Thelema. So maybe his contributions to that sphere are rather overstated. Few can doubt his dedication to the great work, but his resistance to authority catalyzed with his creativity to the point that he couldn't help but forge his own path heedless of the danger. Had he survived longer, maybe this would have resulted in some truly influential work. 
Or maybe he would have succumbed to full-blown magicitis. Who knows? No, his true legacy is in his scientific work. It's because of his academic intuition and perseverance in the face of innumerable failures that this degreeless creative legitimised the work of Galkit, allowing it to grow into the appropriately nicknamed Jack Parsons Laboratory. Following Explorer 1, JPL got subsumed into NASA, where they contracted Aerojet, a company founded almost entirely on Parsons solid fuel rockets, to make the engine for the Apollo command module. Von Karman rated him as one of the most important people in rocketry and the development of the American space industry, behind only himself and Molina. Werner von Braun, preeminent rocket scientist and definitely nothing else, claimed that it was Parsons rather than he who deserved the title Father of Rocketry. In 1968, Molina himself, during a speech at JPL, acknowledged that Parsons' contributions to the field were often overlooked, making note of his key contributions to the development of storable propellants and of long-duration solid propellant agents that play such an important role in American and European space technology. Parsons thought big. He was imaginative, tenacious, but approached life with a child's naivety. He was a man who, in both his aspects, looked at the domain of the gods and said, I want to go there. And though he wouldn't live to see it, he made it possible for us. I stood upon the balcony with my brand new bride. The clink of bells came drifting down the mountainside. Within our sight, something moved, lightning eyed and cloven hoofed. The great god Pan is alive. Amid the modern world in disguise is possible to look into his immortal eyes. He is like a man you'd meet any place until you recognize his ancient face. The great god Pan is alive. At sea on a ship in a thunderstorm On the very night that Christ was born A sailor heard from overhead A mighty voice that cried, Pan is dead So follow Christ as best you can Pan is dead Long live Pan From the olden days And up through all the years From Arcadia To the stone fields of Inishia Some say the gods are just a myth But guess who I've been dancing with The great god Pan Life. Pan is life.